What's going on guys, it's Bromley. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit, I just had on my mind some uh, some of my training history that I had gone through before uh, when I was younger and I was thinking about the way that I came up and what my earliest influences on training were and then how they kind of evolved over time. Because I don't just think about how any one style of training or how any one exercise selection or school of thought influenced me. What I think about is kind of how they change over time. Because one of the big things that limits our ability to study this field is that there are so many variables to control for and there is so much time to control for. Because who you are right now is not the lifter or athlete that you were, let's say, two years ago. And who you're going to be in two years, depending on how you train and what you adapt to, it's not going to be who you are now. And so much of how you adapt to something is entirely dependent on what you did before. I mean, they even have this concept, phase potentiation. It's this idea that what you did before is ultimately going to determine what you do next. And that adds a, uh, and it, that adds a frustrating level of complexity to this entire field because it, it's just one more thing that you have to try and wrap your head around. And ultimately, you just end up making educated guesses. So anyways, I was thinking about when I started training. I started training when uh, I joined the football team. I had never played a sport. I was 13 years old. I was in high school. Actually, I started my freshman year when I was uh, 12 years old. I was 12 years old as a freshman. Uh, I hit my growth spurt that year, so nobody really knew. But I was very young. I was very insecure. never played sports. never really active. And I just got a wild hair, and I joined the football team, thinking that there's something missing. I'm not confident. I don't have friends. I need to make this jump, do something good for myself. And it was the scariest and most life-changing thing I think I've ever done. So I joined the football team, and it was in this tiny town in Illinois, uh, Charleston, Illinois. And there were 10,000 people. It's where Eastern Illinois, Eastern Illinois University is. And it was a real small town. And I remember the coaches, they didn't know a lot about training. They were football players themselves, and they knew whatever little bits they had picked up uh, with their time training. And it was technically they ran the Bigger, Faster, Stronger program, but I couldn't tell you anything about it. I remember we did cleans and box squats. I couldn't tell you anything about rep ranges or percentages or, or anything else about that because none of it was really enforced, right? Like most high schools, the kids go in, they pretty much do their own thing. And if they beat their head against the wall hard enough, eventually they get strong anyhow. So. I remember the clean instruction did not make sense because the person who was teaching it didn't know what a clean was. I'm sure they had done it at some point, but they had no real functional understanding of what they were doing. Uh, I just know we went as heavy as we could. It was what you would expect from most lifters, uh, left unchecked. It was just a lot of, um, it was a lot of heavy failed reps, a lot of just attempts over and over and over until we got it we would do cleans we would just pick a weight that was more than we did last time and we would just miss it a bunch of times and then you know the next week we'd come back we get it and we thought we figured it out so that was the first thing we we're doing i remember doing box squats with 400 pounds i was like 13 years old and we would always pick the high box and we would just start banging out reps with like quarter squats we thought we we're strong as shit and nobody called us on it we weren't doing anything and everything there was just no base building everything was as heavy as we could go and i'm really surprised we didn't mess ourselves up back then because the way we lifted it was so cringy so going from there i switched to a high school in san diego i went to i finished out high school in poway san diego it's much bigger high school much bigger area and we had a little bit more in the way of focused athletic training we actually had real athletic drills we were running through we had different dedicated times to, to lifting, to, to speed agility drills, uh, to practice, to, to tape. So it was a lot more kind of separated out and a lot more intelligent focus. And there was a little bit more of an explanation about what technique was and, and what kind of minimum passable technique was and what range we should be working in. So I remember by the time we got there, it wasn't so much just maxing out all the time. We actually got reps in, we actually got work in. Now that kind of coincided, so I'm 14, 15. This is where I've read a lot at this point, mainly bodybuilding magazines because that's all I had access to. But I read uh, all the same. And you get enough from those publications about just general muscle building, but also about how strength is different because they were always having specials, you know, this expose on, you know, how to increase your bench max or whatever. And you'd have the guys with degrees who were writers 
uh, kind of break down the subtle differences between strength and, and size and how bodybuilders were different than power lifters and Olympic lifters. So I'm 14, 15 years old, and all the way up through the time I was out of high school, probably until the time I was 17, that was kind of my bodybuilding phase. That's where I was still doing the cleans and the presses and the squats, but me and my friends would go to LA Fitness or 24 Hour Fitness, and we would just lift for three and a half, four hours. I mean, that's, we used it as a form of self-harm. So I remember those years, that's where I got the most amount of total work in, and that's where I grew the fastest. And I remember we had bicep day, we go in and do chest and back, we go in, we'd have leg day, we do hack squats, super set with like lunges, we do drop sets on leg extensions because we saw, you know, a video or, or something where a bodybuilder, uh, or we saw an article where a bodybuilder talked about, you know, a three minute long drop set that we do on leg extensions. And at that point, we would just punish ourselves. So that was where it started to sink in that you actually have to get work in. You can't just beat yourself against an immovable object and hope, hope that that's gonna pay off. So of course that coincided with my arms got bigger. My back was one of the first things that grew on me. That's when I fell in love with shoulder work. Advice I got from my cousin who was a football player. He's like, you don't want slouch shoulders. You know, shoulders are important. You need strong shoulders. You can't just bench all the time. I military pressed my ass off and my shoulders exploded. So as my frame got bigger, I actually started to look more like I lifted. And sure enough, all my numbers went up. Before long, I remember missing a 185 bench press in one of the tests we did. And before long, I remember I was you know over 300 pounds. I think I graduated high school. I was 16 when I graduated and I had a 300 pound bench press. So I remember all of these lessons kind of coming in about how you have to train, but I wasn't done yet. I wasn't done learning. It wasn't until I was 16 or 17 that Strongman came on my radar, that I actually had access to powerlifting publications, that I actually found out that there was a such thing as a Powerlifting USA magazine. And it was in my later teens after high school that I actually was able to read through these sources. They talked about specialization, how, uh, you, how unique strength training is in as much as how you can train it specifically and optimize it to be competitive. And then that's where I started to get go down that rabbit hole, which was counter to, to bodybuilding, which was you know a million exercises, all for a lot of sets, a lot of reps, often going to failure. So I had this shift because I saw, I saw what a strongman was and I saw what powerlifting was and I wanted to do that. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know how the hell I would find it. I, the, there was nothing back then. You're talking about 2004, 2003, 2004. Um, Bodybuilding.com was barely a thing. There really weren't forums dedicated to this. Um, I hadn't found the Morunde Muscle Forum yet. And there, there was just such limited information online. So I just had to you know, do what I could and hope for the best. But some of the advice that I ended up taking was you know, simple things that we know now, but things like specificity. Specificity is a basic one. Um, I picked the same few movements and I just did that. I really didn't do any variations. I really didn't do a lot of accessory. I stopped doing all the bodybuilding stuff. I didn't have an arm day anymore. I would just do some bent rows to kind of round out my upper back and that was it. I would do my main presses and that was it. Uh, I started reading Iron Mind publications. You know, I came across Keys to Progress and Stronger Mind, Stronger Bodies. And it was a lot of old uh, world wisdom that had to do with just picking a few compound movements, getting good at them. Uh, this is something that got mirrored, you know, all the stuff Pavel puts out, very similar to this. And I didn't really come across him until years later, but coincided with this school of thought. And the thing is, is it was devastatingly damn effective. Uh, this is ultimately the same school of thought that uh, bred starting strength. This is the same school of thought that bred, you know, the, the three by five linear progression with a few compound movements. So during this era, I started practicing my powerlifting setup. And my phone's going all over the place. Uh, I started practicing my uh, powerlifting bench setup. I got short arms. I had real high arch, real low touch. And man, my, uh, my bench got real good real fast. Uh, all I would do is I go in, go as heavy as I could. And I do that on every lift twice a week. I do it with squats, with deadlifts, with overhead pressing. By the time I was 20, I pushed your 365 for double out of the rack. That stands out to me because that's something I couldn't do without a few weeks of prep right now. And I'm much heavier, much stronger across the board. But I remember I was so dialed into that movement. I remember how good it felt with all that extra practice. And everything was really low volume. Like I said, I ditched the accessory where I was doing a top set, maybe a top three, maybe a top single. It was pretty much whatever the hell I felt. And then I do a back off set and I you know, go to failure. 
and I wouldn't even do a lot of them. I'd do like one set, move on to the next thing. And that was so devastatingly effective. I had about a year and a half of pretty much unchained growth in all my lifts. My squat blew up, my press group blew up, my deadlift blew up. And really the only thing that sidelined me from that was the injury because my deadlift setup was garbage and I had allowed a bunch of weaknesses to persist and I hadn't addressed any of them. And that was really the thing that, that uh, ruined me because I got a few lower back injuries. That... Sorry about that. Camera died. And I was on my way to pick up my dogs from my mom's house because we were gone over the weekend. So pardon that interruption. This is Tank and Bella. Say hi, Tank. Hi, buddy. Oh, they're down for the count. They had a long weekend. All right. So as I was saying, the only real problem I had with the uh, high intensity, high frequency, kind of minimalist approach is that I ended up getting injured. I accrued some lower back issues from the deadlifting and it really came down to just uh, technical idiocy. I didn't know how to brace correctly. I wasn't aware of how important it is to maintain strength and stability in your midsection. I got some injuries. And then as soon as I would heal up, you know, it'd be eight weeks, 10 weeks of no deadlifting because that's the state I was in. Eventually I would start lifting again, build back up, get strong, get hurt again. I repeated that cycle about eight or nine times. Uh, no lie, that was my life for about 10 years to the point where I eventually just stopped deadlifting and just squat and press and I did okay doing that, but that was a, a pretty weak workaround. So, uh, as far as the sustainability of that approach, it came down to, I needed to be more technical. If I had to do it again, I would be much, much more technical and I would employ the cues that I learned now that are important to making you efficient, but also keeping you safe. Uh, in addition to that, understanding how special exercises are extremely important uh, for preventing weaknesses and keeping you well-rounded. Now that doesn't necessarily mean I, I'd go back in time and do a bunch of different variations, but I mean, understanding where weaknesses develop and make sure that at least some of my training time had dedicated periods to keeping myself rounded, to keeping myself uh, padded and insulated from those types of injuries that get uh, that occur because you're inefficient or because you know, one area is a lot stronger than another area and which structures take on how much stress it gets lopsided and that's how you get overuse issues and eventually injuries. So the, the pattern of training very specifically, picking just a couple movements, doing them repeatedly throughout the week, putting out a lot of effort, that worked out fantastically well. It was just my, my approach. Uh, it was the, the way that I employed that that had some flaws in it that led to me getting injured. So if I had to go back in time, it would just be, again, it'd be more focus on technique, more focus on making sure that my weaker areas, my sh I'd spend more time keeping my shoulders well-rounded, uh, doing rear delt work, rotator cuff work, maintaining flexibility. Uh, that would prevent some of the shoulder issues I'd have down the road. Uh, and again, more time on my, mid my midsection. But I'm just going over all this, I'm kind of thinking out loud because this frames how I think about programming. I think the important thing long-term to prevent stagnation and to prevent injury is to conceptualize these long periods of training that vary in how specific they are, how much volume there is, you know, how many total sets and reps, and how much effort you're putting out. Those are the ones that I think are really relevant. So I think it's in everybody's best interest to have periods where you are kind of in bodybuilder mode. There's a lot of different ways to employ that depending on exactly how you you select your exercises exactly what rep range you work in it's not one recommendation but then in general you're doing more total work more total reps more of it's sub maximal so you can actually get more total touches in on your compound lifts uh, i think it should be non-specific and i think that you should have ample time dedicated to rounding out perceived weaknesses and when you can do that it's very liberating very liberating to not be beholden to coming in and performing at optimal capacity every single day to not have to you know walk a tightrope when it comes to your performance because if you don't hit your percentage it screws your progression uh, it's very liberating to to not have to put yourself out to the nth degree as far as how much effort you're squeezing out of your body every single time so to be able to just have your exercise your sets your reps and just get your homework in is very freeing and it's a nice break from the beat down of heavy lifting at the same time after you've done that for so many months and you've grown and you've realized you've made strides in those exercises, you've adapted to that work threshold, 
it's nice to be able to just do a couple big sets and call it a day. It's also very liberating to revisit the skill work, to see yourself start to grow once again, once you start to build coordination in those same movements because you're drilling them a couple times a week and your effort's higher, but you can recover and benefit from that stimulus because you're not doing a million sets. So they both are valuable. They both have things off you. And I think everybody can benefit from swinging between one and the other. Now, as long as you have those big periods, those big phases to work between, you can, there, man, there's so much play in the joints. There's so much discovery you can do as far as what works for you in the short term. Because now it's a matter of how you operate within those phases, how you stack weeks together into waves and how you repeat those waves. And there's a million progressions you can run. There's a million splits you can run. As long as the workload is sustainable and there's an obvious method of progression, there's a ton of play in the joints. And you guys can figure out, take notes. What splits work for you? You know, what, what arrangement of stress allowed your deadlift to flourish the most? Or what frequency was the best on your shoulders when it came to pressing? Take notes, find an arrangement that feels good write it down and put it in your back pocket. So if you ever come back to that phase in the future, you don't have to guess. You'll know that that was a way of doing things that will pay off. You just gotta stick to the plan. So uh, as far as stacking weeks together, like I said, even when I was just going heavy as I could twice a week on squats, presses, and deadlifts, they grew. The, uh, the big problem was a technical breakdown and overuse issues from going too heavy. So if I had to do that again, I would, I would do some of the progressions that I've advocated for, the wave progressions, which keep stress, you know, climbing and dropping, climbing and dropping. And that allows you to continuously push the effort on, you know, like a three week cycle as opposed to every week. And that gives you enough variety to recover and it doesn't beat you down quite as much. There's ways around it. But even when I was hitting the gas, it's like I got strong so quick and it was very consistent. Even if I had a drop off one week, there's weeks you go in and you just feel like crap. The stress accumulates too much. It's hard to predict when that's going to happen. Sometimes you don't know it happened until it did. And then if you're smart, you'll look back and see what series of events took you there. So you make, don't make that mistake in the future. But even when the stress grows too much and you see a dip over a week or two, over the long haul, that comes out in the wash. So it's nice to know that you don't have to walk such a tightrope as long as you're operating in this new threshold and you are intentionally advancing forward in some way, shape, or form, you're going to grow. And then eventually there's a point where that growth slows down and then it's time to make a change. It really is as simple as that. So as long as you guys aren't being stubborn and beating yourselves into the ground or something's not working, as long as you're taking notes and you're prioritizing the important things, which is keeping yourself well-rounded and keeping your technical consistency very high, you're gonna be a-okay. And once you stack a few of those phases together successfully, it's, the light bulb is going to go off. You're going to be like, hey, I figured out how to program. And that's really what it comes down to. The trick for guys like me and why it's so hard to do a lot of this stuff, is, it really is uh, the fact that everybody is different. It really is the fact that um, Mike Trusher talks about this. I went over some of his videos over the weekend before we left for our trip. And, uh, you know, we talked, he has different types. Uh, I don't know if it's ABC or one, two, three, but he has different types for how people progress differently over the introductory phases he has them go through. Basically what he does, he has everybody go through the, the same lift every week, the same split every week. Um, you know, if it's a one at an RP eight, you'll do that multiple times for, for a couple of weeks, four, five, six weeks, until he establishes where you hit a crescendo in progress um, you know, where you hit that heavier weight at an RP8 before things fall off. He calls that a peak event. And what he found is that there's different groups of people that broadly adapt. You'll have people that go three weeks with nothing and then they'll see a dramatic increase or you'll have people that progress pretty linearly. Maybe that coincides to so whether they're more novice or more advanced. Uh, he probably would have recognized that if that was the case. But his struggle as a coach is saying, okay, what's your rate of progression that I can expect? Now we gotta operate around that. And that's tricky to get down, especially when you're talking about someone you don't know uh, and you're talking about uh, a lot of different variables, a lot of different lifts, it takes time. So it, one of the reasons is that the longer I get into this, I think it is in the average lifter's best interest to kind of skip coaching culture, get a handle on a few fundamental basics and pay attention because nobody's gonna know how your body responds like you do. And by the time you get somebody else to understand, at that time, you're in the hole a few grand. So 
it's it's a risk you know i it's one of the reasons I, i'm not a big fan of remote coaching i tried it out last year i saw how much work it was to do it right even when you do it right there's a lot of discovery a lot of trial and error and it's hard to justify getting somebody to pay a few hundred dollars over a course of a few months just for the privilege of having somebody else finally get a handle on exactly how your body responds so you can get things straight moving forward and it doesn't always work out the way you want it to so it's a bit of a gamble it's a big commitment it's it's a hard thing to run you guys are better off I genuinely believe this with few exception with few exceptions I think most of you guys are better off starting with a few foundational principles good exercise selection good technical foundation get a baseline of work in a specific threshold start improving upon that regularly that's about it do that until the wheels fall off if you're new you'll run it for six or eight months if you're more intermediate the uh, stagnation is going to come a little bit sooner once you recognize that that's what what is going on make a calculated change change the specificity change the novelty of the stimulus change your recovery there's a lot of things you can change make some shift into a new threshold so you can start growing again you know to go from treating everything as developmental exercises to treating it as a skill go from you know training like a power builder to training like somebody in contest prep those experiences will not only keep progress ticking forward but it will condition you to understand exactly how you respond because that is what separates uh, a seasoned coach who knows their athlete from somebody who's just giving you their best guess based on prior experiences and there's there's a big gap that's a very important difference to understand you know it's, it's the entire difference is in predictability so anyways I know I covered a lot there that was that was a bit of a rant I went out on uh, I know I covered a lot there. That was a bit of a rant I went off on, um, but I just had those things on my mind. So let me know what you guys think. Appreciate everybody's support. You've all been fantastic. From myself, Tank and Bella, thanks for watching, guys. Till next time, I'll see you.